Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shaheen. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for uh, that uh, great introduction. I think um, over the course of the uh, day and tomorrow, you'll hear a lot about PyTorch, and uh, we want to make it very clear that this is a very high priority for us to make sure that PyTorch and XLA are successful together. Um, for those of you who may not know about PyTorch XLA, uh, what PyTorch XLA enables a customer or a user to do is to take a PyTorch model and essentially convert it into an XLA program for running. So it is a backend for uh, Torch Dynamo that takes the PyTorch operations, converts them into uh, stable HLO uh, ops, and then uses the same PGRT uh, runtime APIs to basically run that model on the device. At a high level, this integrates PyTorch with uh, the architecture of uh, OpenXLA. A little bit about the history of the project. It started in 2018. Uh, this was originally uh, created to ensure that PyTorch uh, users can run their models on uh, TPUs. Um, at DevCon in 2019, this was uh, announced with collaboration with Meta, Facebook at the time, and Salesforce. Um, 2020, uh, it reached uh, general availability with the support for Cloud TPU pods uh, and several other ecosystem uh, companies like Lightning, uh, who started working on integrating PyTorch XLA uh, into their libraries. Uh, 2021, we had a major move towards TPU VM. This is an architecture change that had a lot of changes into how we implemented PyTorch XLA. Uh, we also added and continued to grow the ecosystem for PyTorch XLA with other libraries that were um, integrating PyTorch XLA. Uh, 22, uh, we did a major runtime uh, move. Uh, we started to integrate PGRT. Uh, worked on FSTP implementations, started working on Dynamo uh, integration. And that brings us to 23 and uh, the changes that has happened over uh, the last several months. Uh, when I was looking at the slides from the last Dev Summit back in April, I realized how much we have actually done over the last six months to make uh, PyTorch XLA better and well integrated into uh, the OpenXLA uh, ecosystem. Um, Obviously, the support for stable HLO and uh, PGRT, as I mentioned, uh, have now completely landed. Uh, we have done a lot of um, work to make sure that the PyTorch XLA library becomes more um, dependent on the OpenXLA as a project. So moving all of the dependencies to a new uh, GitHub repo that was created for uh, OpenXLA, as well as introducing several new features, including SPMD for running models on a distributed environment and enabling uh, large uh, models such as Llama. Uh, again, back in April, when we were talking about this, we had only uh, Dy Dynamo had actually been just released because I think the release that was sometime in March um, and we had just uh, come up with the benchmarks for Llama, the first version. Since then, obviously, Llama 2 uh, has come out, and we have been able to uh, now demonstrate the performance of Llama 2 using PyTorch XLA. And into 23, the rest of the year, whatever is left of it, and 24, we have uh, several areas of growth. As Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, GPU is one very high priority that we want to make sure that the performance of PyTorch XLA through GPU uh, is very uh, good and competitive. And we'll continue to improve the uh, APIs for distributed, for export, and various other uh, features that the PyTorch uh, has released in 2.1 and is going to continue to work on uh, moving forward. I actually uh, recognize several uh, faces from yesterday where we had the PyTorch conference. Uh, and I know that uh, these are uh, top uh, of the mind for many of the folks who are uh, following the PyTorch developments. So as I mentioned, there are certain changes that you may not even see through uh, you know, uh, 
release logs uh, and things like that. One major piece is the amount of refactoring that we have done uh, in the code uh, to make it cleaner, uh, ensure that the size of the uh, package is smaller, uh, is uh, you know available through PyPy, uh, has the uh, correct abstraction layers so other uh, hardware uh, vendors can actually uh, be able to build using PyTorch X Slate for their uh, environments. And then uh, we have also published uh, dev updates. I uh, invite those who might be interested to take a look at the uh, PyTorch Dev Discuss uh, with the latest uh, plans and uh, directions that we are following for 2.2 and perhaps some of the 2.3 uh, developments upcoming. I mentioned Llama 2. I uh, thought maybe it would be a good idea to take a look at some of the uh, performance benchmarks. Uh, we have done both inference and training for Llama 2. Uh, these are uh, some of the results that we have obtained on uh, all three different flavors of the model, 7 billion parameters, 13 billion, and 70 billion parameters. Um, for us, uh, ensuring that there is a high model flux utilization has been always an important thing because we uh, obviously want to make sure that Llama uh, and any PyTorch model runs well on uh, you know accelerators uh, in the cloud. And so we'll continue to make sure that this uh, would move forward in the same direction and try to ensure that the MFU for training these models is continuously uh, competitive, as well as obviously the throughput and uh, latency for inference workloads. One other thing that I want to highlight is the scalability. So uh, as you may know, the architecture of TPUs is such that you can uh, utilize uh, models across many, many uh, TPU pods. And so with the introduction of the SPMD APIs into PyTorch, one of the nice things that we can easily achieve is to harness the power of the XLA as a distributed compiler and ensure that we can run our models at very large scale uh, with very little change in the code. And so when you want to train a Llama 2 70 billion uh, parameter model, all you need to do is to basically set the a few parameters uh, when you are launching the work. And uh, it can easily grow from a single pod of 256 chips all the way to 16,000 chips uh, without making any uh, changes in your code. And to highlight, that these uh, pods are actually communicating over um, data center networking. And still, the degradation that you may receive from uh, the MFU is um, essentially negligible. Uh, and you can uh, still take full advantage of that same code and be able to run it at a much larger scale. A little bit about the repo. Uh, we continue to ensure that the repo has a lot of uh, healthy uh, environment. We want to make sure that the PRs uh, land uh, as soon as possible, that the issues are responded to and are closed uh, in time. So we track some of these. Uh, we have grown the number of uh, committers to the uh, repo, and we are uh, continuing to get more and more uh, interest from uh, the industry in uh, participating and submitting changes and being part of developing PyTorch XLA and bringing their requirements uh, based on uh, their unique environments that they have. Some thoughts about the direction. Uh, interoperability is uh, one of the top things, as uh, was mentioned earlier by Andrew as well. Uh, XLA can do GPUs and CPUs, and uh, we want to make sure that this uh, is as inclusive as possible for PyTorch XLA. We want to ensure that uh, other uh, partners who are uh, in interested in using PyTorch XLA, including uh, you know, Tranium and Inferentia and others, can take advantage of PyTorch XLA to run their workloads. Uh, performance has always been a very important thing for us, so we want to make sure that this continues to be um, a focus area for development for the team. And as mentioned earlier, on device is also super important, and uh, we have uh, started to look into this a lot uh, over the past uh, several quarters, and we'll continue to uh, work on solutions that enables PyTorch uh, to run uh, on device through the stable HLO conversion. 
Uh, I'll go through the uh, next few slides a little bit uh, faster. Uh, if there are there is a um, uh, breakout session later uh, in the day, uh, and uh, actually tomorrow as well, there is another breakout session. Uh, so please uh, come, and we'll, we can have more deep dives onto um, the questions that you may have around the APIs and uh, the development. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, PyTorch Explay is now a uh, backend for Dynamo. So uh, essentially, all you need to do is to use the same Torch Compile uh, APIs that uh, PyTorch provides and provide uh, uh, the backend to be OpenXLA uh, for your uh, models to go through the uh, OpenXLA path. Um, SPMD, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, something that we introduced in 2.1. We'll continue to work on it for 2.2 and 2.3. This, uh, I think, is one of the most important things, especially on the server side, uh, to ensure that we can uh, you know, achieve uh, the kinds of performances that I uh, showed for uh, Llama. Um, distributed checkpointing, deterministic data loader, these are things that we are focusing on in uh, the near future for the next releases and we'll uh, update when uh, those are uh, available. Uh, I don't go into, I won't go into the de details of this PMD, but just so that uh, we're all on the same page, we're working very closely with uh, Meta to ensure that the API for Detensor is very much aligned with how we want to run SPMD. And so there's another talk uh, later today as well on uh, this uh, SPMD integration that I invite you to uh, attend. And again, just like the torch.compile, our goal is to make sure that the API is as close as possible to uh, what PyTorch provides. So uh, if PyTorch will have a, a device mesh uh, that takes an input as uh, either CUDA or XLA, we want to be able to abstract away all the rest of the complications about how the uh, SPMD works behind that API so that the user experience would remain uh, as true to PyTorch as possible. Uh, inference, uh, so as I mentioned, the export path is a super important uh, path for us. Uh, we currently are able to take a PyTorch model, uh, export it into a stable Achillo model, uh, and basically save it for uh, other environments to uh, run, whether it is on, uh, on devices or on server. Uh, this allows us to make sure that uh, the inference uh, stack becomes more um, unified and uh, can benefit from all the other improvements that may happen uh, from the other frameworks, including JAX. Um, GPU focus, as I mentioned earlier, I'll uh, skip through this because I th think I'm running a little bit late for uh, time. But one thing I want to uh, highlight is Palace. Uh, I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with Palace. There's a great talk by my colleague later today uh, talking about JAX and Palace. Uh, one of the things that we will try uh, to uh, implement within PyTorch XLA is to basically enable a PyTorch user to use exactly the same uh, Palace call that a uh, JAX user would be able to use. So that within your uh, PyTorch workload, you would be able to have a custom uh, kernel that runs a uh, Palace uh, operator within your uh, model. Another very important area for us is debuggability. We'll continue to focus on ensuring that we have uh, better debugging tools, that we integrate this as much as possible into the rest of the PyTorch ecosystem for debugging. Um, and with that, I want to uh, invite Han to come here and talk about the stable cello enhancements on uh, PyTorch. Thanks, Rohin. Hi, everybody. I'm Han from Torch XLA, and I, I would like talk a little, a little bit more about the stable HLO module and what it can do to export a PyTorch program into stable HLO. Uh, so here's the API which we introduced, uh, one of the APIs. So this is based on Torch export API, which has been introduced uh, in the Torch uh, 2.1. And along with the 2.1 Torch XA, uh, joint release, uh, we also introduced this uh, exported program to stable HLO uh, uh, API. And what this returns is an object uh, which inside will contain the stable HLO bytecode. Uh, the weights and some metadata. So one thing about Torch export, uh, which is very helpful to us, is that it extracts all the function parameters and leaves them as inputs. Uh, that uh, would be familiar to people using JAX. That, that's exactly how JAX also behaves. Uh, so in this uh, returned object from uh, our export, also contains some metadata of mapping the weights to the position positional inputs for the uh, stable HLO uh, bytecode. 
And what, what can you do with it? Well, you can save, you can, you can load it back and become the same thing. You can also evaluate it uh, in place with the same inputs. And this evaluation is actually uh, calling PGRT client uh, on the device, passing down the stable HLO bytecode and running that bytecode. Uh, so in the same process, you can verify that uh, the correctness or the numerics of the programs. And what else can you do? You can also run command and convert that into a TF saved, mo uh, saved module. Uh, and the TF saved model uh, inside of it will contain the stable HLO bytecode, but wrapped uh, with a TF XLA call module op. So it's a single op uh, TF graph with all their ways. Uh, we're gonna put the ways into TF variables so they, they are not in the protocol buffer, they are, they are outside in the same directory. Um, to bypass the protocol buffer uh, size limit. And, uh, and this can run with TF serving. Uh, if you're inside of Google, you can also upload this file to uh, Solomatic and uh, send RPCs to it, it will work. So of course, uh, there's a several steps to get the TFC model. If people prefer one function call, you can also do it. Uh, save a torch module as a TFC model. It takes the model as an N module. It takes the input that we're, we're gonna use to trace uh, to call torch export with and the output directory. And for that one shot, you can go from a torch dot module to a TF save model for serving. And of course, this function currently depends on TensorFlow uh, because we need to create a save model. And that's why the default API uh, currently doesn't produce a save model by default uh, because it doesn't, does not depend on TensorFlow. And also we have a community contribu contribution uh, on exporting, uh, getting minified stable HLO. So a little bit of background is that PyTorch has a minifier uh, which runs on top of FX graph so that if your model uh, has some numeric issues or have some accuracy issues, it can bisect the FX graph and give you a smaller uh, reproduction of, of your, your issue. And you can file issues using that. You can put that into unit test. Um, so AWS customers found out that uh, the user don't want to give them their PyTorch model, but they want to give them stable HLO uh, bytecode or, or text so that for, for their engineers to debug. Uh, so they made this contribution to PyTorch so that there's an option uh, via guarded by an environment variable to produce, uh, instead of producing FS graph uh, as a minifier result, can produce also stable HLO uh, as a minifier result. And that's uh, also using the same API of exporting uh, FX graph uh, or Torch models as a stable HLO. And that's all I have. And uh, one minute for questions. Yeah, maybe we have time for one question, then we have a PyTorch deep dive later, so you can ask questions there. Any questions? So does this Torch XLA support model quantization? Uh, Torch XLA, so the question is, does Torch XLA support model quantization? And a uh, short answer is that we're working on it. A uh, slightly longer answer is that there are few versions of quantization. So one, thing, one way is you export towards a uh, stable HLO float graph and then run the quantization on that. So that one is actually uh, work, we tried it. And the other one is using Py, uh, PT2E, PyTorch uh, 2.0 export quantization, which is announcing 2.1. And then after that, you will have a, a quantized graph in PyTorch and then you, uh, you export the quantized graph. And that path uh, has been working in progress and mainly we need to add the operators needed, uh, the operators such as quant and dequant into the exported uh, artifact. Uh, so, yes. Thanks.